Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, today, we're going to cover chapter five, the covalent bond model. Remember in chapter four, we talk about ionic bonding, which is the transfer of electrons. So in this chapter, we're gonna study another type of uh, bonding characters for uh, compounds for atoms bonding together. So first, uh, as usual, we have a guideline for this chapter. We're gonna talk about the bonding model, what is covalent bond, and we're gonna talk about how do we represent covalent bonding by using Lewis structures and uh, the formation of covalent bond and also a very unique type of covalent bond called a coordinate covalent bond. And then we're gonna learn a systematic way for drawing Lewis structures showing covalent bonds. And then we're gonna study the geometry of molecules, the polarity of the bonds and the polarity of the molecules. And finally, we're gonna study naming molecular compounds from covalent body. So this is the guideline for this chapter. We're gonna cover all the aspects. Now, first of all, let's do a very quick overview or comparison between these two types of bonding. Like we said, there's no definite types like a cut between these two types. Uh, we're just learning these two extremes types of bonding characteristics. Uh, between their comparison, okay, the first and the most important for you guys is to understand what types of elements are involved in each type of bonding. For example, in ionic bonding, we studied in chapter four that we know ionic bonding is mostly between a metal and a non-metal element because in order to realize electron transfer, you need a metal to lose the electron and a non-metal to gain electron. Uh, on the other hand, for covalent bonding, usually uh, because there's no transfer of electrons, usually we're looking at bonding between non-metal elements. So that's the biggest difference between these two types of bondings. Of course, uh, number two, uh, ionic bonding involves the transfer of electrons, covalent bonding instead of transfer, they're sharing electrons between atoms, okay? Ionic compounds don't have molecules in their structure. If you remember in chapter four, we studied ionic compounds. They're like a big network of crystal lattice. So the ions are stacking with each other to form a huge network. So you don't see any discrete molecules in the structure, like NaCl, you don't see that in, in the structure. You only know that the ratio of the positive ion and the negative ion is one to one in this case. But in this chapter, because the, the atoms are sharing bonds, we do see molecules, individual molecules existing for this type of compound involves a covalent bond. When covalent bond is involved, we call those molecular compounds. And uh, ionic compounds, number four, ionic compounds are mostly solids and room temperature, and they have very high melting, melting and boiling points. But molecular compounds can exist in all three different states, solid, liquid, and gases. And lastly, ionic compounds, they usually dissolve in water, will dissociate into ions, into free ions, which will cause the solution to conduct electricity because you got free charged ions. But a molecular compound, uh, even though even some are soluble in water, but because they don't dissociate, okay, because they have uh, they have covalent bond, which is fairly strong. So most of them, okay, there are some typical examples. We will see that in later chapters. But most molecular compounds, usually they don't dissolve in water. Uh, they don't dissociate in water, even though some dissolve in water. So molecular compound solutions usually don't conduct electricity. So these are the main differences and very useful differences comparing these two types of bonding and also the compounds resulted from these two types of bonding. Of course, in this chapter, we're going to study covalent bond. Okay, the model for covalent bond is very straightforward. Because of sharing electrons, you need two atoms to get in close. So for example, this is the simplest covalent bond. You can see uh, two hydrogen atoms. Each hydrogen atom has one single electron. We know that. So to, when two hydrogen atoms getting close, uh, these two hydrogen atoms, when their orbitals later on, 
and we can talk more when the octaves overlap, they will share a pair of electrons instead of each one having only one single electron. So you can see that after the approach, each one will kind of like give one electron, but instead of transferring, they share these two electrons between these two atoms. And that shared pair of electron, we call that a covalent bond. So because of that shared pair of electrons holding two nucleuses, remember hydrogen nucleuses or any other nucleuses are positively charged. So the negatively charged electrons pair holding these two nucleuses together, that is basically a covalent bond. Okay, so if you, uh, instead of using that model, if you use uh, Lewis structures showing the symbol and also the dot showing electrons, you will see that each one of them giving one single electron and then they have a pair of electrons shared between them. We call that what? Shared electron. And most importantly, uh, after sharing, okay, after sharing each hydrogen now have two valence electrons because they share two. So each hydrogen actually achieved the noble gas configuration of that period, which is what helium, we know is not eight, but for hydrogen, the noble gas configuration is helium. So both hydrogen here actually achieved the helium noble gas configuration. So they're both satisfied via sharing of two electrons. Okay, so here are more examples showing you the sharing of electrons. Uh, you can see that the first example is between hydrogen and fluorine. Okay, hydrogen has one electron, fluorine has seven. So when they share a pair of electrons, you can see that hydrogen now has two valence electrons, but fluorine now end up with eight valence electrons, which is both satisfy the octet. Okay, both satisfy the octet. Or the second example is the sharing of two electrons between two fluorine atoms. Instead of via sharing, both fluorine atoms now achieve eight valence electrons around each fluorine. You can see that uh, through sharing. So you can see the idea of sharing electrons is still the same, like we discussed in chapter four. The atoms are trying to what? To achieve octet, to achieve the noble gas configuration. And uh, the third example is between a bromine and a fluorine. You can see that they also share a pair of electrons so that both bromine and fluorine atoms now have eight valence electrons around them. Both of them are satisfied with the octet, the octet. Now, uh, in order to distinguish the shared pair of electrons, we usually use a dash to represent that. So for example, between the shared electron between two hydrogens, instead of using two dots, I use a dash. Between the shared electrons between the hydrogen and fluorine or fluorine and fluorine or bromine and fluorine, you can see that I use a single dash to represent that shared pair of electrons. And then, we call that dash a what? A covalent bond, okay, covalent bond. So the shared pair of electrons, the dash is the one that involves bonding, okay, involves bonding these two atoms as well, we use a dash. And now you can see that the other ones that are not shared, we still don't use dash, we still use the Lewis dots to represent the electrons that are not involved in bond. But now remember for uh, drawing the structures, when you have a pair of shared electrons, instead of using two dots, we use dashes so that we can tell people that is the bonding electrons and that is covalent bond. Okay, now what we know the shared bonding, shared pair of electrons, we use a dash. So how about the one that are not shared? What, how do we name them? Okay, the one that are not involved in bonding, that means the pairs of electrons on the atoms that are not represented with the dash, we call those electrons non-bonding electrons or lone pair electrons. Okay, I would like to mostly I call them lone pair electrons, but you can call them non-bonding electrons. You will see the names both ways. But again, shared pair of electrons, the one that's involved in bonding are called bonding electrons represented with dash or dashes. And the one that are not involved in bonding, you can see those dots are called lone pair electrons or non-bonding electrons because they're not involved in bonding, okay? So here, uh, uh, this picture gives you more examples of showing structures, showing covalent bond via sharing of electrons and via the one, the notation we have just learned, the dashes and the dots. You can see that the first example is between two hydrogen and the oxygen, okay, two hydrogen and oxygen. 
um, two hydrogens give two electrons for sharing with the oxygen. So you can see that after sharing, all three atoms achieve the octet. Of course, we change the shared pairing with two covalent bond, and there's two that are not sharing. We call those lone pairs. You can see that on the oxygen, there are two lone pairs, okay, two lone pairs. And the second example is between three hydrogen and a nitrogen, because nitrogen has five valence electrons. So three hydrogen sharing with the nitrogen, all atoms achieve the octet. And of course, the one that are shared, we represent them using dashes. The one that is not shared, we use dots. We call that non-bonding electrons. And the final example is between a high, four hydrogen atoms and a carbon atom. Carbon has four electrons. So four hydrogen atoms share electrons with, this, with carbon. Everybody achieves octet and you have four covalent bonds. There's no non-bonding because you have four hydrogens attached to it. So you can see these are examples. And of course, these examples not only showing the structure, and we call that Lewis structure of these molecules, but also we show what electrons are represented with dash, what electrons are not represented with dash, we call them lone pair electrons, okay, lone pair electrons. Now, for the previous examples, we all see uh, two atoms, okay, no matter what atoms, been two atoms sharing only one pair of electrons. And one pair of electrons, we use a single dash. We call those bonds single covalent bonds because they're only involved two electrons shared. But in some cases, okay, some cases or in some molecules, we do find uh, atoms does not have to share only one pair of electrons. Sometimes they have to share two pairs of electrons or three pairs of electrons to achieve the octet. For example, uh, the bonding between carbon and two oxygen, you can see that carbon has four valence electrons, oxygen has six valence electrons. You can see that now between carbon and oxygen, there are two pairs of or total four electrons shared okay, between each carbon and oxygen. You can see the carbon, oxygen, carbon, oxygen. So between them, there are actually four electrons between these two, four electrons between these two. Okay, I mean, two pairs in order to to achieve the octet. Now you can count every atom has eight valence electrons if you look at it. So if that's the case, okay, that's the case. We, instead of using a single dash, we need to use a double dash to represent that four electrons or two pairs of electrons. We call those bonds double covalent bond. They're still covalent bond, there's just more electrons shared. And similarly, uh, in the third example between two nitrogen atoms, Okay, they are actually sharing three pairs of electrons. You can see that three pairs of electrons. Okay, and three pairs of electrons meaning six electrons. And in order to achieve the octet for both nitrogen atoms, and we call that three pairs of electrons using three dashes, we call that triple covalent bond or simple triple bond. So you can see that um, in order to achieve the octet, the atoms are trying to share one pair, two pairs, or three pairs of electrons. And, and correspond uh, respectively, we will have single dash, double dash, triple dash to represent single, triple, and and single, double, and triple covalent bond. Okay, covalent bond. Of course, later on, don't worry, we're going to study how do we draw the Lewis structures in a very systematic way. Now you just know these are the Lewis structures of these molecules, and the elements are mostly non metals, they're sharing electrons. And the electrons that are shared are represented with dash, depends on the number of electrons shared. We use symbol double and triple dash, okay, triple dashes. Okay, now, so far we have seen COVID and bond. Uh, the sharing of electrons is resulted from two atoms. Each one has a single electron. So for example, in the top case, okay, in this picture as shown in the top case, X and Y, when they make a covalent bond, the shared pair of electrons come from each one of the X and Y, right? Well, X has one single electron, Y has one single electron. When they share, they make a covalent bond. So that's one, the, the, most of the, all the cases we've seen so far. But there is a very unique type of covalent bond in which the shared pair of electrons both comes from one atom instead of another. So in that case, you can see that if both electrons come from one atom, so in this case, the X, then the Y will have an empty orbital available for bonding. So in that case, they're still sharing, but those shared pair came from 
one instead of came from both. And we call this type of covalent bond coordinate covalent bond. Okay, in coordinate covalent bond, both electrons in the shared pair came from one of the two atoms involved in bonding instead of coming from both. This is not extremely common, but it's still common, commonly seen, and it is a type of covalent bond. Of course, covalent bond, because both electrons came from um, one single atom after they share, they still can achieve covalent bond because they're actually still share a pair of electrons. Okay, share of the pair of electrons. Okay, so uh, in order to uh, show you an example of of coordinate covalent bond, I have an example here. Hold on, let me see why I, why I cannot show up here. We okay, have an example here. Okay, why I cannot. See here, let me see. That page is deleted. Hold on, let me pause the, the recording. All right, welcome back. Okay, I think I found uh, the problem, so uh, let's continue. Like I said, coordinated covalent bond, the bond is shared pair of electrons came from one of those two atoms involved in bonding. So the other one are actually providing an empty orbital for bonding. And that is, again, not extremely common, but is actually seen in, in many cases. So one of the examples shown here is NH4. If you guys uh, studied in chapter four, NH4 is called ammonium ion. It is actually formed between ammonia, which is NH3, and a hydrogen plus ion. Okay, hydrogen plus ion. We know hydrogen has one electron. When hydrogen becomes hydrogen plus, that means the hydrogen loses one that electron. So this hydrogen plus is basically empty, has an empty 1s orbital, right? Now, on the other hand, nitrogen, ammonia, the nitrogen in an ammonia, besides those three covalent bonds, it does have a pair of lone pair electrons that are not involved in bonding. So what happened is the nitrogen donates both electrons to that hydrogen plus to make a bond, okay, to make a bond between the N and H. Remember, they need a pair, but in this case, both electrons came from the nitrogen. So after the bonding made, you see now nitrogen has four bonds, four NH bonds, because one of the new one is made through coordinated covalent bonding. Okay, but after the bond is made, you can see that the NH4 has four NH bonds. So after the bond is formed, you cannot distinguish which one was the original coordinate, coordinate covalent bond. Now every four of every one of those four NH bonds are the same now because after it is bond, the molecule that the species is ammonium ion. But remember, one of them is coming from the formation of coordinate covalent bond. Okay, coordinate covalent bond. Another example is in the molecule of uh, uh, HClO2, okay, HClO2. HClO2, the, the molecule can be, can be viewed as uh, forming between HClO and a oxygen atom. Okay, you can, see, you can view it as that. Okay, this is an acid, HClO2 is a, a chlorous acid, I think, chlorous acid. And this acid can be viewed as forming between HClO and the oxygen. And you can notice that between these two species, okay, when you want to add an oxygen to that chlorine, the oxygen has six valence electrons. And six valence electrons means the oxygen needs two to make a bond, okay, to make a bond. And oxygen cannot give any, any, any other two. Oxygen needs two to form, become eight valence electrons. So in this case, what happened is the chlorine used one of the one pair of its lone pair that are not involved in bonding, share with the oxygen. Okay, share with the oxygen, raise them all. After sharing with the oxygen, you know, these two electrons are actually from chlorine. Oxygen, you can see oxygen still has six on its, on the other side, okay? Oxygen is not giving any for thing for sharing. Oxygen simply provides a empty orbital for binding with that chlorine. And that shared pair of electrons are actually both from the chlorine, both from here. Okay, both from here. So after the bond is shared, you got a new covalent bond, but you know that this covalent bond is actually a coordinate covalent bond because both electrons in that bonding pair came from the chlorine. 
it came from the chlorine. Again, there are many uh, molecules that are involved in coordinate covalent bond. You have to just have to discover when you have a shared pair, does that pair both come one of the atoms involved? Okay, I just want to share with you this info and we have more practices. You will see that more examples in your practice and also in your quiz and tests. Okay, quiz and test. Now, after we introduced uh, what is the basis of covalent bonding and also what is the basis of, of bonding, non-bonding, and also the types of covalent bond, in, in, including normal covalent bond and also coordinated covalent bond. Now let's get, take a look or get started with a very, very important topic. That is, how do we draw a correct Lewis structure systematically? How do we draw a Lewis structure showing covalent bonding? Okay, because you see, previously we give a lot of examples of different types of molecules if COVID and bonding with a lot of electrons. But if I ask you from scratch, I give you a molecule, how do we draw the Lewis structures from scratch? Okay, trust me, it is very easy, but you need to use these steps very carefully until you're comfortable, you can throw the steps away and draw anything you want. But in the beginning, I strongly recommend you to, to use these steps very closely and step by step. Okay, so let's take a look. I'm using uh, the molecule SO2, okay, sulfur dioxide, okay, SO2. Remember, they're both nonmetals. This is a molecular compound. Okay, SO2 is an example to demonstrate the steps. Okay, the first step, when you see a molecule, the first step is to calculate the total number of valence electrons available in that molecule. Okay, that means the total number of valence electrons like, valence electrons of all the atoms in that molecule. Okay, SO2 has one S, two oxygen. So you have to know, oh, what is the valence electron for sulfur? What is ox valence electron for oxygen? They happen to be in the same group, group number six, six, eight. So oxygen and sulfur each has six valence electrons. So all you need to do is add the electrons together, six for sulfur, two of the oxygen, each one is six. So total, we have 18 valence electrons for sulfur dioxide. Okay, that's the first step, calculate the total number of valence electrons. And you may wonder why we do that, because remember, in, in, in chemistry, the bonding is involving what? Valence electrons only. So we have to know, hey, how many electrons we're going to show up there in chemical bonding. Okay, the second step is draw the skeletal of the molecule, place a single covalent bond between the central atom and the surrounding atom. So here are a few concepts. What is skeletal? What is central and surrounding? Okay, when you have a molecule, okay, when you have a molecule, a molecule arranged in the way that you have a central atom and some atoms around it. So the, the second step basically is ask you to draw the arrangement of the atoms, draw the skeletal of it. Okay, usually if you have a molecule, the atoms appears only once, like sulfur dioxide, sulfur appears only once, usually is the central atom. If not, you will mostly be told and for the purpose of this class. So in this case, I draw the sulfur as the central atom, okay, as the central atom. And then of course, the surrounding atoms will be the oxygen, two oxygens, okay, two oxygens. So I draw the sulfur at the center and draw two oxygens on the side and then bond the sulfur and each oxygen with a single covalent bond, okay, with a single covalent bond. Now, you know, a single covalent bond here Okay, after we use a dash, if you still remember, we, we just talked about a few minutes ago, the single dash represent what? A pair of bonding electrons, right? Single electron involves, single dash involves two electrons. So after you draw the skeletal and then bond these atoms with a single covalent bond, you basically used two electrons there and two electrons here. So there are two electrons here, and you also use the two electrons here because each bond is two electrons. So after that, because you used for, for two electrons and two electrons, you need to subtract four electrons from your total. Remember our total is 18. After you bond these two, you use the four electrons. You need to subtract four from that total of 18. So that means you only, now you only have 14 electrons to play with to keep moving forward. Okay, again, the second step, okay, overview, draw the skeletal, place the central atom and also the surrounding atom, then bond the central and the surrounding with a single bond, subtract the number of electrons you used from bonding, 
from the total, okay, used in bonding from the total, which is 18 in this case. Okay, next, okay, next, after you draw the skeletal with a single bond, you place, okay, you place electrons on the surrounding atoms first to satisfy the octet of the surrounding atom. That's what I say here. Add non-bonding electron pairs about the surrounding atoms such that each atom bonding to the center atom has a octet. So you basically satisfy the octet of the surrounding atoms first by placing electrons on the surrounding atom. Okay, by placing electrons on the surrounding atom. We know the surrounding atoms are oxygen and each oxygen has two electrons already from bonding, right? Two electrons shared from bonding. So in order to satisfy the octet eight, each oxygen needs six electrons placed on it. Okay, remember the bonding electron is two. Okay, the bonding electron is two. Okay, bonding electron is two. So each oxygen has two electrons already. So in order to satisfy, you need add six on one oxygen, add another six on another oxygen so that you satisfy the octet for the surrounding atom. Again, do the surrounding atom first. Then after you add six plus six, which is 12 on the surrounding oxygen, you keep subtracting 12 from that 14. Remember the previous step, we have 14 left. So you subtract 12 from 14, you only have two left now, okay, two left left. Of course, final step, not final step, you only, the only chance or, or only option you can do is to place the remaining two on the central because remember the surrounding oxygens are satisfied already. You don't need to worry about the surrounding oxygen. They're satisfied, okay? You need to place that two remaining atom oxygen, I'm sorry, two remaining electrons on the sulfur. So after that, you got a zero left because you put the remaining two, subtract two more out of the two. So you get a zero left. So at this stage, do not add electrons, do not remove electrons. Those are the 18 electrons you can see. If you guys can, well, are curious, you can actually count the number of electrons. Okay, there are actually 14 electrons seen and also two bonds. So total is 18. Okay, you can get actually count them. And remember you have 18. That means you, you cannot add or remove any electrons at this stage. But one thing you need to check is after you put that remaining two on the sulfur, is the sulfur satisfied? We know we satisfy the oxygen already, don't worry. But is the sulfur actually satisfied? If you look at the sulfur, the sulfur actually has six electrons, okay, two bonding and a, and a pair of non-bonding. So the sulfur apparently is not satisfied. So our Lewis structure is not done, but we cannot add any electrons more because our electrons are all used in here. Okay, again, sulfur not satisfied, but we cannot add electrons more because we used all 18 electrons here. So what do we do? Okay, very simple. You borrow, okay, you borrow some or two electrons from the neighbor oxygen. Okay, borrow the non-bonding electron from the oxygen, make the non-bonding into what? Into bonding. So of course, after you borrow two from the oxygen, the single bond, you have to change it to double bond. And in that case, what you did is basically change two of the electrons from oxygen from bonding to non-bonding. Those two electrons don't still belong to oxygen. You didn't take it away, but you make it non-bonding to shared, now to bonding. So now you can see that use one or more pairs of non-bonding electrons on the surrounding atom to form double or triple bond. You achieved octet for everybody. Okay, now sulfur, you can see that has six bonding electrons, two non-bonding electrons, sulfur is happy. And the oxygen is still happy because oxygen has two non-bonding pairs and two bonding pairs, still eight billion electrons. And again, you didn't add any electrons, you just borrowed from the neighbor. So the total is still 18 here. Okay, total is still 18 here. Okay, now of course, final step, you need to double check if everything's correct. But again, if you follow all these steps, your Lewis structure will be correct. And I uh, recommend you to, to, to watch this sequence again and again until you fully understand how do we draw a Lewis structure. Okay, again, briefly, let me go over these steps one more time. First step, count the total number of valence electron. Here is 18. Number two, draw the skeletal of the molecule so that you have a central atom, surrounding atom, then bound the central with the surrounding with a single bond and subtract the electrons used from the total in bonding. 
Next, satisfy the octet of the surrounding by adding electrons to the surrounding atoms, and then subtract the electrons you used here. And then finally, place the remaining electrons on the central and check if the central atom is happy or not. If not, borrow the non-bonding electrons from the surrounding atom to make double or triple bond until all atoms are satisfied. Do you remember, you cannot add extra electron or remove electron at this stage because you used all the total number of valence electrons you calculated, okay? Here are some examples. Some of them I give you a stepwise a hint or even give you the structure. Some of them I really hope you can practice because you will be asked to draw Lewis structures in our tests and quizzes. Okay, here is the Lewis structure of of SO3, sulfur trioxide. Okay, the same steps. Okay, I want to repeat those steps. Hope you can repeat the steps with me. You can pause the video and draw the structure together with me. And then, like I said, after a while, you don't need the steps anymore. Okay, the first step, count the total number of valence electrons. SO, SO3 has 24 valence electrons, S and three sulfur. And after that, I draw the skeletal of the molecule with sulfur and three surrounding oxygen. Use three single bonds to bond the sulfur and the oxygens. Three single bonds are six electrons. So I subtract six from 24, I have 18 left. Okay, next, I satisfy the octet of the surrounding oxygens. I add six electrons on each oxygen because the oxygen has two from bonding already. So add six and six and six. So I add 18 electrons on the surrounding oxygen. I had 18, I added 18. And that means after satisfying the octet for the surrounding oxygens, I have zero electrons left. Okay, zero electrons left. Then I check the central sulfur. Of course, sulfur only have three bonds. And that means not happy because three bonds are six electrons. So what I need to do is borrow two electrons from the surrounding oxygen to make a double bond. And after that, everybody's happy achieving the octet rule. Okay, that is, this is the correct Lewis structure for sulfur trioxide. Okay, and uh, here are more practice for you. Okay, more practice for you. Uh, ammonia, carbon dioxide, uh, carbon tetrachloride. These are the Lewis structure you need to practice drawing. I have the key here. Okay, you can cover the key. Like I said, you need to use the steps, draw all the Lewis structures until you're comfortable uh, through the, the, the steps away. Okay, again, I, I hope every one of you by the end of this chapter can draw any Lewis structure of any given molecules uh, without any uh, problem, okay, without any problem, right? So that is Lewis structure. And a quick little challenging, uh, little challenging exercise here is, asking you to calculate the total number of valence electron present, not in the molecule, but in a polyatomic ion, okay, polyatomic ion, SO4 two minus, okay, SO4 two minus. Remember, uh, SO4 two minus, we studied in chapter four, it's called sulfate ion, okay, it's by sulfur and four oxygen with a negative two charge. So it asks you to calculate total number of valence electrons. We know calculate total number of valence electrons, which is add the number of valence electrons all together with all the atoms present. Of course, sulfur is six, oxygen is six, but we have four oxygen. So basically six plus four times six, which is 30 for SO4. So 30 for SO4, that is number of valence electrons. However, this species is not a molecule, but it's an ion with a negative two charge. So you may ask yourself, where does that negative two come from? The okay, negative two means what? Something gained two electrons, negative charge. So if this species gained two electrons, that means what? On top of the total nine valence electron, you need add an extra two valence electron. So the total number of valence electron instead of 30 from that calculation should be 32 because again, this is an ion gained electrons to get a negative two charge. Okay, total number is 32, okay? Now, with that, I wanna show you uh, something we didn't show in our chapter four, that is the bonding involved in compounds with polyatomic ion, okay? Just like we did, sulfate SO4 has the Lewis structure like this. You can see the SO4 within sulfur with two, four oxygens, 
Okay, that's the Lewis structure of SO4. You see that in polyatomic ion, the atoms are actually covalently bonded, even though it is an ion, but it's just bigger ion with covalent bonding. But if you have a ionic compound such as potassium, K2SO4, okay, this is an ionic compound involves polyatomic ion. Then the bonding between the potassium and sulfate is no longer covalent because this is an ionic compound. So you can see that what happened here, the bonding character is involving both bonding we have actually studied. The bonding within sulfate is covalent bond between sulfur and four oxygen, but the bonding between the sulfate and the potassium ion is actually ionic compound. You can see there are ions, potassium ions and sulfate ions. They're actually stacking with each other like a network. So ionic compounds containing polyatomic ion are examples of compounds that contains both covalent and ionic bonding. Okay, the bond between the metal and the ions are ionic bonding, but the bond be within the polyatomic ion is what? is covalent bond. So when you draw the structure of these compounds, you need to keep that in mind. The compound is still an ionic. That means between the K and the SO4, there's no covalent, there's no dash. It's just ion, potassium ion and sulfate ion. The reason you need two potassium is because the potassium charge is one. Sulfate is two. So in order to balance the charge, you need two so potassium per sulfate. Okay, that's why the ratio is two to one. Okay, but Within the sulfate, the, the bonding is dash covalent bonding. Okay, again, ionic compound containing polyatomic ion is a combination of both covalent and ionic, ionic bonding. And you need to know where are these located. Okay, next, after we learn how do we draw a correct Lewis structure, or how do we represent a molecule with a Lewis structure? Our next step is to determine the okay, is to determine the geometry of a molecule. Okay, what I mean geometry is molecules are not two-dimensional. Okay, most molecules are not. And molecules are in fact a three-dimensional arrangement of atoms. So when we draw a Lewis structure, we're actually only showing the molecule on a two-dimensional surface on paper, right? That's what we structures do. But in fact, the molecules are not two-dimensional. Most of them are three-dimensional. So after we draw the Lewis structure, we need to further determine, hey, what the molecule really looks like in a three-dimensional space. Because knowing the three-dimensional arrangement of the molecules is very important for us to understand the chemical and physical property of that molecule. So that means we need to know the geometry, the three-dimensional geometry of the molecule. Okay, so in order to know the geometry, there are a few things we need to clear. The first thing is with the help of the Lewis structure, Okay, with the help of Lewis structure, we can determine on the central atom how valence electrons are located, how many valence electrons are located. Okay, to be more specific, how many groups of valence electrons are located on the central atom? Okay, you may wonder why do we care about the central atom? Because remember, if you want to learn the geometry of something, you want to know how the surrounding things are arranged around the central, just like a flower, right? If you want to know what the flower looks like, you need to know how the petals are arranged around the center of the flower. The same idea for a molecule. In order to know the geometry of a molecule, we want to know the central atom first. And then we know how these surrounding ones are, are arranged around the central. So the first things we need to know is how many groups of valence electrons are on the central atom. And then after we know the groups of electrons around the central atom, because the electron groups repel each other because we're all electrons, okay, no matter their bonding electrons or non-bonding electrons, there are groups of electrons. They don't like each other. They repel each other. So the electron pairs or groups will spread themselves as far as possible. And that spread themselves 
make the geometry of the molecule, determines the geometry of the molecule. Again, you know electrons are around, arranged around the central atom with the bonding, non-bonding, and these electrons don't like each other, they will repel each other. So the repulsion will determine what? The geometry of the molecule. That is what we call valence shell electron pair repulsion theory called VSPR theory. And this theory will help us to determine the geometry of the molecule. Okay, again, I know it's in the beginning, it's very abstract. We will see a lot of it example, don't worry. But here, no two facts. One is you need to know on the central atom, how many pairs of electrons, okay? And how many pairs or groups of electrons. And now we later on determine these electrons will repel each other. And that repulsion gives the geometry of the molecule. So let's first take a look, take a look at the first step. How do we know the electron groups around the central atom? Okay, around the central atom. There are two guidelines, okay, two guidelines. The first guideline is no matter you have a double or a single bond, that means no matter you sharing two electrons or sharing four electrons or sharing six electrons in a triple bond, these electrons in a bond are all localized between the region of these two atoms. In that case, no matter which bond you're talking about, double, single, or triple bond, they count as one group of electrons. Okay, no matter you're sharing two electrons, three elect four electrons, or six electrons, they just more electrons. But the shared electrons in a bond, no matter double, single, or triple bond, in the bond are localized in a group. So in that sense, one bond, regardless a single, double, or triple bond, count as one group of electrons in on the central atom. That's the first one. How do you know the number of electrons? Okay, number of groups. A bond is a group. Two bonds is a group. A double bond counts one, one group. A triple bond can count as one group. Okay, because they're all localized. Okay, that's the first rule. Number two is, besides the bonding, the non-bonding pair are actually separated. So each non-bonding pair is one group. If you have two non-bonding pairs, there are two non-groups. So when you count the electron groups, you don't, you don't distinguish bonding and bond, non-bonding. When there is bonding, that's one group. When there is a non-bonding, that's another group. And there's two non-bonding, there are two more groups. So each lone pair also counts as one group. So these two rules basically tell you what? A bond is a group, regardless of single, double, or triple bond. A lone pair is also a what? A group, no matter how many lone pairs you got, how many groups. So with that logic, take a look at these four cases here I want to show you. I want to show you and also demonstrate the, the ways we just talk about how do we calculate the number of groups on the central atom. Okay, of course, first you have to recognize what the central atom. Okay, the first molecule, the central atom is carbon. You can see on the carbon atom, there are three bonds. Okay, one is a double bond, another two are single bonds, three bonds, three groups on carbon. Okay, the second molecule, water. On the oxygen, there are two bonds and two pairs of lone pairs. So total four groups, two bonds, two lone pairs. Okay, on the third molecule, there are four bonds around the carbon, so four groups around the central atom. On the last one, of course, phosphory has five chlorines bonded to it. There are five bonds, that means five groups of phosphorus. So here, this, these four molecules, hope I can, I can give you an idea. Again, what we're focusing here is know how many electron groups are on the central atom. Okay, and the electron group, is either a bonding or a pair of non-bonding. Why we care? Because these number of groups repel each other will help us to determine the geometry of the molecule. Okay, now after you know, you can pause it. After you know how to, how to calculate the total number of pairs, let's get started. Okay, let's get started. Okay, look at these following molecules, okay, two molecules. Okay, both molecule, the central atom, the carbon, both molecule, the central atom is staying in the carbon, has two groups of electrons. The first molecule carbon dioxide, you can see it on the carbon, there are two double bonds on the left, on the right. Two double bonds means what? Two groups, we said each bond is a group. Two bonds is two group. Okay, in the molecule on the right, carbon has one double bond and a triple bond. Again, a triple bond is still one group. So each carbon has two group. Okay, in both molecule in that sense is the same. So if a central atom has two groups, the best repulsion separate 
okay, separate them, the maximum separation of these two is what? Is straight, right? It's straight, one on the left, on the right, or one on front and back or top, bottom, whatever. So the maximum separation because of repulsion is what? The molecule arrange a linear geometry, okay, linear geometry. So both molecules are what? Like a line, linear. Okay, because what? Because this group separate the most. If, if the geometry is linear, the angle between these two bonds, like here, between from here to here, the angle between these two bonds is 180 because it's straight. So if a central atom has two electron group, the geometry will be linear and the bond angle is 180 degrees. Okay, hopefully you now get some idea about the molecular geometry. Okay, next, okay, next. If Around the central atom, there are three electron groups, such as the molecule on the left, okay, such as the molecule on the left. You can see on the carbon, there are two hydrogen, two single bond, and a, an oxygen, a double bond, three groups. Then the best separation of these three groups is to adopt a geometry called trigonal planar geometry. Okay, trigonal planar geometry. Molecule is like a plane, but the, 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 the the three bonds are arranged in a triangle geometry like this. Like this is called trigonal planar geometry. Again, these all three are on the same plane. Okay, same plane. The bond angle is three, 360 divided by three is 120, right? The whole is 360. You have three angles. So divide by three is 120 is the bond angle. So that is the geometry of the molecule on the left. Okay, geometry on the molecule on the left. Now. It is a little different for the molecule on the right. Okay, for the molecule on the right. If you look at the geometry of, uh, or look at the, the structure of sulfur dioxide, we actually have draw this structure just a few minutes ago. Okay, on the sulfur, it also has three groups, a double bond, a single bond, and a pair of lone pair. Okay, a pair of lone pair. So you have three groups of electrons. And we just said three groups, these three groups, will adopt a geometry called trigonal planar. That is the same, okay, that is same. And that is called the electron group geometry, which is what, which is trigonal planar. However, if you look at SO2, out of those three groups, one of them is lone pair. That means there's no bonding here, no atoms here, right? It's just empty electron. So the geometry of the molecule is not trigonal planar because again, that's lone pair, that's pair of electron over here. So the geometry of the molecule is like this. You can take this away like this. And we call the geometry bent geometry okay, or angular geometry. So now you see that because the presence of the lone pair in SO2, okay, because the presence of the lone pair electron in SO2, the Electron group geometry is not the same as molecular geometry. Electron group geometry for these three groups with the lone pair is still trigonal planar, but one of them is not a bond, not an atom over here. There's no atom over here. So the molecular geometry is bent. Okay, it's bent. This is what the molecule looks like at the end of the model here. Okay, that's bent. So keep in mind, keep in mind, when you determine the geometry of, of the molecule, you first, of course, using the number of groups, determine the electron group geometry. If the, the molecule has no known pairs, just like the molecule on the left, then the electron group geometry is the same as the molecular geometry. The molecule looks the same as the electron groups. But if the molecule like this SO2 has lone pair, then you have to ask yourself, okay, what if I take the lone pair away? What does the molecule really look like? Okay, in this case, trigonal planar geometry of the electron group will become what? Bent geometry of the molecule because of the presence of one lone pairs. Okay, don't worry, we have more examples. Here, okay, I listed three molecules here. Okay, three molecules here. The, all three molecules, you can see that has four electron groups around it. On the left one, four bonds. On the middle one, three bonds and a lone pair. On the right one, two bonds and two lone pairs. Okay, total is all four, four of the three molecules. So if a species has four, has four electron groups, 
the geometry determined by the four electron groups because of maximum separation is called tetrahedral geometry. It looked like this. Okay, it looked like this. Of course, four faces, so no matter how you arrange that, it will be the same. Okay, let me use a shorter pen to demonstrate. Okay, shorter pen, just okay, I'm gonna move a little further. Okay, this is called tetrahedral geometry. Okay, four, it's a three dimensional. Okay, three dimensional. Okay, you see that? This is called tetrahedral geometry. Okay, tetrahedral geometry. Again, every face, every bond is the same. Okay, it's a regular shape of, of, of tetrahedral. Okay, that's what the four electron groups look like. And the bond angle from tetrahedral, from, from tetrahedral geometry is a number 109.5 degree. Okay, that means the bond angle here is 109.5 degree. Now, the same. After you know the geometry of the electron groups of these four groups, you have to ask yourself, does the molecule has a lone pair or not? On the molecule on the left, CH4, the carbon has four bonds, no lone pair. So the electron group geometry is the geometry of the molecule, hydrogen, 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 hydrogen. And we call the geometry tetrahedral as well. Yeah, that's no surprise. But if you look at the molecule on the middle, besides three bonds, it does have a pair of lone pair. That means this is lone pair. So the electron group of geometry for NH3 is still tetrahedral, but the molecular geometry look like this. And we call this geometry, see, it's like a pyramid. We call that tracnal pyramidal. Okay, the base is a triangle, but it's like a pyramid. So the geometry is Tragonal pyramid. Okay, tragonal pyramid. Now, the molecule on the right, water, it has four electron groups. So the geometry is tetrahedral for these four electron groups. Again, electron group configuration is, is what? It's tetrahedral. But if you look at the molecule, it only has two bonds. The other two are lone pairs, right? You only have two bonds. Okay, two bonds. The other two groups are lone pairs. So if you have, if you take the two groups away, okay, no matter which one you take away, the molecule look like this. We call that what? Bent geometry. Okay, bent geometry. Of course, this bent, the bond angle is close to tetrahedral bond angle, 109.5. Okay, it's different from the previous bent because this bent was derived from what? Was derived from tetrahedral. Okay, derived from okay, again, tetrahedral, one lone pair, fractal pyramidal, two lone pair, bent. The bond angle is 109.5. So again, you can see these three cases. Uh, you determine the, the electron group geometry. You have to ask yourself, does the molecule has lone pair or not? If it has lone pair, you will have a derived molecular geometry. Okay, molecular geometry. Now, not only uh, with that theory, this PR theory, we can determine the geometry of the molecule with only one central atom. We can actually determine the geometry or shape of the molecule with multiple, okay, with multiple atoms, such as uh, examples shown here. Okay, I just want to show you the water molecule, how useful this, this theory is. Okay, you can see the molecule on the left. Uh, the carbon has two, two groups. This carbon also has two groups. So both carbon is linear geometry. That means the whole molecule is what? It's a line. You can see that this is what a molecule looks like, linear geometry. Okay. Uh, on, on the middle molecule, the oxygen has four groups, but two lone pairs. We know the geometry is bent. Okay. This oxygen has four groups, but two lone pairs. We know the geometry is bent. So that means the molecule has two bent on the, on the overall. So you can see that there's a bent here. And there's another bent here, so that's why the molecule looks like like a zigzag because you have two bent, okay, two bent. On the molecule on the right, this nitrogen has three groups and a lone pair, so the geometry is bent here. And this nitrogen has two groups, linear, so you can bent followed by a linear. That's why the molecule looks like this, bent followed by a linear. So again, you can see that with that theory, not only you can tell the geometry of the molecules with only single, a simple molecule, like a single atom, you can actually determine complex molecules and know, hey, what the molecule actually looks like 
in a three-dimensional space, the three-dimensional space. And one of your lab, okay, building Lewis structure, drawing Lewis structure and building models, the lab will give you plenty of exercises. And also you can actually use the kit in your, uh, in your lab kit to build the molecule. You can actually visualize after you determine the geometry, can you build a model with that geometry and does it match with each other? Okay, you can practice those uh, with, with, again, lots of examples. Hope you can take advantage of that lab and get very comfortable and fast with determining the Lewis structure and also the geometry of a molecule. Okay, here's the summary of what we have just said of uh, overall, okay, join the Lewis structure and then determine the number of electron groups. Again, when you determine the electron groups on the central atom, uh, bonding is one group, non-bonding is another group. Okay, and when you count bonding, don't distinguish single double or triple bond, they're just one group of electrons. And after you uh, determine the uh, number of groups, follow the, the guideline of Vesper theory, two groups, linear geometry, three groups, trigonal planar geometry, and four groups, tetrahedral geometry. And those are the electron group geometry. And finally, you need to ask yourself, when you count the group, is there any lone pairs? If there's a lone pair or two lone pairs, then you have to derive the electron group geometry into what? Molecular geometry. If there's no lone pairs, then the electron group geometry will be the same as molecular geometry. Okay, that's so far what we've learned about Vesper theory and join loose model determine the geometry of the molecule. Okay, here are some exercises. I can leave it up to you. Uh, of course, draw the Lewis structure of these two molecules, determine the geometry of these molecules, and also determine the bond angle of each molecule. I wanted. I want you to use that, both of them, to practice. I think you have the key in the note area. You can use that key, or you can ask me questions after you're done, okay? And uh, I think for this chapter, you can slightly pause here. And uh, uh, when you have time uh, later on, you can keep watching. But I'm going to continue uh, our next topic after uh, we study the Lewis structure and determine the geometry. Okay, that is electron activity, okay? What is electron activity? Okay, when electrons, okay, what when when atoms are are sharing electrons, okay, like A and B, when they're sharing electrons, uh, sometimes the sharing is not equal. Some atoms attract electrons more than the other. Okay, even though the bond doesn't show that, I mean they're sharing, but in fact, the atoms sharing electrons may not be equal. Some atoms may have a greater attraction to that electron shared. And that attraction of electrons, we call that electron activity, okay, electron activity. It is the measurement of the tendency of an atom to attract electrons towards itself. Of course, higher electron activity means what? Higher attraction of the atoms for the shared electrons. Lower electron activity means what? Lower attraction. And here you can see that we arranged the electrons, but we arranged these, atoms in the order of the periodic table. And also we give the number of the, the magnitude of the electron activity for the elements. You can see that lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, these are the main group, most of the main group elements. You can see that their number of electron activity is, is, is listed like a, like a bar, bar chart. Okay, and of course, we don't need to memorize these numbers, but when you see these numbers across the whole periodic table, you can observe some trend. Okay, so that's something very important to us. What is the trend of electron activity? If you notice that in this periodic table of electron activity, metals normally what have lower electron activity than than what than non metals. You can these are metals. Their electron activity is much lower than than the corner on the up right corner for the for the non metals. And also, if you notice that the electron activity actually increases if you move from left to right. And also electron activity increases if you move from the bottom to top, right? So the, this direction is the increase of electron activity direction. Okay, higher electron activity from left to right and higher electron activity from top to bottom. So your electron activity increase like this way. 
that's the very important trend of electron activity. Again, what's electron activity? Attraction of electrons when they're sharing electrons with another guy. So because of that trend, you notice that also the number is given to you, fluorine in our periodic table is the most electron active element with the element with the greatest electron activity. Of course, we don't talk about noble gas. Okay, noble gas normally do make covalent bond with, with, with other atoms. So here is electron activity. Okay, some quick check before we move on. Why do we need to know about electron activity? I'll give you some quick check first. Okay, first uh, concept check is asking, in a bond between fluorine and iodine, which one has more attraction of electron? When a fluorine is on top, iodine is in the bottom, from top to bottom increases, so fluorine has greater electron activity. Okay, if lithium and fluorine react, which one has more electraction? Lithium is on the far left, fluorine is on the far right. We know fluorine has what? Greater electron activity. See, if, without the number, if you know, understand the trend, you can determine the electron activity using the periodic table. Okay, and I will leave these practice for you to determine and based on the trend, again, we're not memorizing numbers, but we need to know the trend. We need to understand what it is, electron activity. I'll leave that practice for you. Okay, then let's take a look. Why do we need to know electron activity? What is so useful about electron activity? We know electron activity is the attraction of electrons between two atoms. Okay, higher attraction, higher electron activity, higher attraction. So when the atoms share electrons, the one with the greater electron activity, we're gonna what? We're gonna grab electron toward itself. And that will cause a very unique property of a bond called polarity. Okay, when the electrons are not shared equally because one, one atom is sharing more because it attracts more because of greater electron activity. Because of that e equality in the sharing, okay, inequality, I'm sorry, inequality in the sharing, atoms may have different sharing of electrons. The one with greater electron will grab more. And that's what we care about a chemical bond. And we call that polarity, okay, when the bond is sharing is not equal. So in order to understand polarity, let's take a look at this following chart. Okay, following chart. Remember, the difference between sharing is because of what? The electron activity. So when A and B are sharing electrons, okay, sharing electrons, the difference between their electron activity becomes very important because, like I said, the one with greater electron activity will share more. The one with less electron will share less. So the difference between their electron activity plays a very important role to determining which one shares more, which one shares less. Okay, when atoms, like this picture, their electron activity difference is small. Difference from small means what? They're similar, right? When A and B are similar, then their differences are small. So when the electron activity difference is small, between zero and 0.4 range. Then we assume their sharing is equal because their difference is small. Nobody attracts more than the other. So the sharing is very equal. We call this type of bond nonpolar covalent bond because the sharing of electron is close to equal. Okay, nonpolar covalent bond. Now, if their electron negativity difference increases, Difference increase means what? One is bigger than the other. That means there is a difference. Okay, if one has greater electron activity than the other, that means their difference will be bigger. So if their difference is between 0.4 and 2 range, again, electron activity difference, then one of the atoms will share more electron than the other, causing the electrons close to cloud, the shared electron close to one and the other. So the one with greater electron activity will have a slightly negative charge because the electrons are negative shared. And the other guy will have a slightly positive charge. They're still sharing, but the electron coming towards one instead of the other. And that inequality of sharing, and this type of bond with some charges over there, okay, partial, the delta sign is partial charge over there. We call it polar covalent bond. Okay, polar covalent bond. 
Now, if the electron activity keep difference, keep increasing, they're so different, such as between a metal and a metal, the difference is huge. If that's the case, then these two atoms may not even share. What happened, the electron will transfer from what? From the metal to the non-metal. They cannot even share anymore. Then you end up with what? Pure charge, plus and minus, because the electron is transferred, not like shared. And we call the bonding what? Ionic bond, which is we learned in chapter four. So now you see that different types of bonding, there's no really cut -out limit. They're continuous. Sharing similarly with small electron activity difference, nonpolar bond. Sharing inequal, equally with greater electron activity difference, polar bond, but it's still sharing. You've got partial charge. If the electron activity difference is too big, the transfer will be completed. The electron won't be shared. Then we have what? Ionic bond. Okay, ionic bond. So ionic bond is basically in what? Extremely polar covalent bond. That means they're not, not, not share anymore. They're just transfer. Okay, of course, for a polar bond, greater difference, the bond is more polar. If it is too big difference, the bond will change from polar to ionic. Okay, that's what we put here. Greater difference, greater the difference in electron activity, the greater polarity of the bond. That means what? Greater inequality in sharing. Difference is bigger, then the inequality is, is, is bigger. If it's too big, then no longer sharing. Okay, so here are some practice for you asking you about uh, the difference between the polarity, asking, determining. Like we said, polarity is determined by what? Electron activity difference. Greater difference, more polar the bond. So if you take a look at the A, NF, OF, and CF, they're both bonding with F. So which one has greater difference? You can ask which one is further away from F. Carbon is on the left, followed by nitrogen, followed by oxygen, followed by fluorine, if you take a look at the periodic table. So carbon is the one that is further away from fluorine. If the carbon is all further away from fluorine, means what? The difference between CF bond is the biggest. So CF bond is the most polar, followed by NF bond, followed by OF bond. Okay, descending order. So the most polar is CF bond, NF bond, then OF bond. Okay, OF bond. Okay, that's the first practice. The second one, okay, CF bond, NO bond, and SA, a silicon F bond. Okay, this one is not all the same period now. They have silicon. But if you look at it, we know CF bond is polar, very polar, because C and F are far. Silicon is below carbon. If you look at the periodic table, okay, you can pause the video, take, out, take a look at, take, take your periodic table out. Silicon is below carbon, meaning what? The electron activity of silicon is even smaller. Remember, the trend is moving up, increase. So silicon, the electron activity is even below carbon. So that tells us what? Silicon and fluorine bond difference is even greater because C and F are this far and silicon is here. So the difference between silicon F is even greater than the difference between C and F. So the one with greater polarity is silicon and fluorine bond, followed by CF bond, followed by NO bond. NO bond are close, and then the oxygen are next to each other. So see, you don't need to, to memorize the number. You can based on the trend to determine the electron activity difference, and then you know greater difference, more polar the bond, greater polarity of the bond. Okay? So I'll leave the third one uh, for you to practice. Again, all the keys are provided. Can you need a copy of the periodic table to answer these questions? Okay, further away, more polar because the electron activity is more different. Now, once we have a polar bond, okay, how do we how do we represent that polar bond? Okay, there are two methods. Okay, one method is to mark the charge 
Okay, mark the charge. Remember, they're still sharing, so the charge is partial charge. That's why I put a delta in front of the charge. Okay, of course, the one with greater electron activity, like HCl bond, okay, Cl has greater electron activity. So the one with greater electron activity will have a partial negative charge because the electron is positive. You grab the electron towards itself. And the one with smaller electron activity will have a partial positive charge. So you mark the charge, you show people the bond is polar. Another way is to use an arrow. An arrow, the head of the arrow points to the one with the greater electron activity. The tail of the arrow with the cross is at the one with less electron activity like this. Okay, the arrow points at the one with greater electron activity. And we call this arrow notation the dipole of the bond. Okay, dipole, okay, dipole of the bond. Okay, the arrowhead again points to the one with greater electron activity. So these are two ways of representing a polar covalent bond and also showing people the charge, the partial and fractional charge. Okay, more practice about the bond. Okay, I will I will do a couple of them with you and I'll, I'll have a couple of them for you to practice as well. And again, keys will be in the notes. Okay, this first practice, I think it's very interesting, is which of the following bonds will be the least polar, but still polar? Okay, women, polar means what? The electron activity difference have, have to be different. Okay, have to be different. So you don't consider this one, like O and O, because O and O, the electron activity is the same, so there's no difference. The bond is not polar. They said least polar, but has to be polar. Okay, has to be polar. So you're looking at what? You're looking at CO, SIO, and NO. Why don't we look at MG, MGO? Because MGO is two polar. MGO is between metal and non-metal. That's two polar. We don't even consider. They ask least polar. So we're looking at CO, NO, and SIO. Between those three, which one is close to N, uh, close to O? Nitrogen, right? Nitrogen is the one right next to oxygen. So nitrogen oxygen difference is the smallest smallest difference means what smallest polarity so the least polar one is no bond okay no bond that's why it's very very interesting it needs a lot of analysis to answer this question okay i'll leave this to you okay leave these to you to you to answer this one ask you which one is the most polar but not ionic okay again needs a lot of analysis and to, to answer this question, and the key is in the notes. And if not, ask me questions. Okay, next. After we determine the polarity of bonds, okay, after we determine the polarity of the bonds, we need to take a look at the whole molecule. Because we're looking at single bonds, A and B. Are they polar or not polar, ionic, or just single bond? But some molecule may have more than one bond. So we need to take a molecule as a whole to see the polarity of the molecule as well. When we determine the polarity of a molecule, there's a few cases, a few scenarios. If you have a molecule that has only two atoms, diatomic, okay, if you have a diatomic molecule, like two atoms, two atoms, how many bond? One bond. So that means if you have a molecule with only one bond, then it's very simple. If the bond is polar, the molecule is polar. If the bond is nonpolar, the molecule is nonpolar because that's the only bond. Okay, for example, this one, the molecule HCl. Okay, HCl. Diatomic. The bond is polar. H and half chlorine is, is polar. The dipole is pointing to the chlorine. So if the bond is polar, the molecule is polar. What does it mean, molecule polar? It means in the whole molecule, the charge distribution is not equal. More charge, more negative charge on the chlorine, less negative charge on the, on the hydrogen, means more positive charge on the hydrogen. So you can see that overall the molecule is like charged. That's why the molecule is polar, determined by the bond. If you have a triatomic molecule, like it means three, Okay, if three atoms in the molecule, then 
the case becomes a little more complicated. It not only determines the bond, but also whether the molecule is symmetrical or not. Okay, symmetrical came from what? The geometry. That's why we learned geometry early, remember? Okay, symmetrical plays a very important factor to determine whether, whether a molecule is, is polar or not, not just the bond. Okay, for example, this is carbon dioxide. Okay, carbon dioxide is a triatomic mark. The bond between C and O, you have two CO bonds, right? Carbon dioxide, two CO bond, one CO bond, one CO bond, all that. Each bond is polar because C and O, their electron activity is different. Oxygen is more electron active, so you can see the arrow points to the oxygen. See that, let me erase that. Okay, you can see the arrow points to the oxygen. Another arrow also points to the oxygen because oxygen is more electron active. So you have two polar bonds for this triatomic molecule. But because the geometry of this molecule, remember two groups of electrons, the geometry of the molecule is linear for this molecule. Linear is a very symmetrical shape. So these two dipoles, these two polar bonds cancel with each other. So overall, the molecule electron distribution is very equal. Okay, very equal. So what does it tell us? Even though carbon dioxide has polar bonds, but because the geometry is linear, the polar bond canceled each other, overall, the molecule is not polar, it's non-polar. Okay, that's why we said triatomic molecule is a little more complicated. You have to consider the geometry, whether the molecule is symmetrical or not. Okay, let's take a look. Two more cases. The first case, and second case, we should say, is water. We know water, the geometry is bent. Okay, if you can take a look, that's why you have to know the geometry first. And also water contains polar bond. Oh, which bond is polar? The, the arrow points to the oxygen because oxygen is more electron active. So you have two arrows pointing to the oxygen like this, and monic is bent, remember. Bent geometry is not symmetrical. Because these two arrows, they're both pointing up. Do you see that? Like pointing like this. So overall, they're pointing straight up. And because of that, these two dipole moments, these two polar bonds don't cancel each other because bent geometry is not symmetrical. And because of that, water molecule is polar. Okay, the oxygen end of water has more negative charge. The hydrogen end of water has more positive charge. That's how the charge is di distributed in water because the arrow point up. The bottom case, this molecule is linear now. Okay, it's linear now. But if you look at these two bonds, one bond is HC bond, another one is CN bond. Both arrow point one direction instead of left and right. Okay, H and C bond, Carbon is more electron active, so the arrow points to carbon. Between C and N bond, the carbon is, nitrogen is more electron active, so the arrow points to nitrogen. So both arrow points to one direction. And even though the molecule is linear, but these two, wave, because they're pointing on the, they're on the same direction, they cannot cancel each other. This one, you can cancel each other. This one, you cannot. So this molecule is what? Also polar. This end of the molecule has more negative charge, this end has more positive charge. See, do you see that? When you, when you analyze molecule with, with multiple bonds, with, with, with triatomic molecules, you have to analyze the bond and the geometry. Do these two polar bonds cancel with each other or not due to that geometry? Okay, next example, sulfur trioxide. The bond is polar, SO bond is polar, but because the geometry is trigonal planar, it's a very symmetrical geometry. So SO3 is a nonpolar monica because all these three bonds cancel each other. Okay, it's a triangle. Even though the bond is polar. And finally, these two cases, you can see that a CH4, okay, four bonds are the same. And the geometry is tetrahedral, it's symmetrical. 
So CH4, nonpolar because the bonds cancel each other. However, on the right, you, if you replace one of these with a chlorine, even though the geometry is symmetrical, but the chlorine bond is more polar. So the four bonds cannot cancel with each other because that, these four bonds are not the same, even though the geometry is symmetrical. So the polar will point up to chlorine because chlorine is very electronegative. So overall, this molecule has a negative charge. Uh, uh, sorry, pa. This molecule has a negative charge here and a positive charge here. So the molecule on the left, the bonds can cancel each other. The, the polar can cancel each other polar bonds. It's nonpolar. The molecule on the right, B, the polar cannot cancel each other because C, CL bond is more polar. So the whole molecule is polar. Okay, but they can't, do not cancel. So you can see that every molecule you have to analyze the case by case, but you need to know two things. The first thing is, are the bonds polar or not? What is the arrow point for each bond? And then next question, based on the geometry of the molecule, do the arrows, do the arrows cancel with each other or not? If they can cancel, nonpolar, the molecule. If they cannot cancel, the molecule is polar. Okay, so we have learned two different concepts, the polarity of the molecule and also polarity of each bond. Okay, here's the summary. Okay, summary in, in case you find it helpful. In order for a molecule to be polar, you need to satisfy both conditions. Polar bond and also the geometry is not symmetrical. That means they cannot cancel. Okay, you have to have polar bond you have to have a unsymmetrical geometry so that the polar bonds cannot cancel each other. If that's the case, polar. If you cannot satisfy both, then non-polar. So this is something can be very useful for you to determine the molecule if polar or not. If molecule is polar, the bond has to be polar and the polar bond don't cancel with each other. Okay, don't cancel each other. So here are a few practices here. Okay, uh, I think have the key uh, in the notes area as well, uh, can try to uh, first ask yourself, what are the bonds? Are the bonds are polar or not? And number two, how about the geometry of the molecule causing the bonds to cancel with each other or not? If they cannot cancel again, the molecule will be polar. Okay, these are four molecules. The Lewis structure is given, so you don't have even have to draw the Lewis structure. You can based on Lewis structure determine the geometry of it. Okay, for example, I will study the first one with you. NH3, the bond is polar. Okay, bond is polar, NH bond is polar because N and H are different. And nitrogen is more electronegative. Okay, nitrogen is more electronegative means the arrow points to nitrogen. So you have three bonds point to nitrogen. Okay, three bonds points to nitrogen. And if you look at the molecule, the geometry has four groups, three bonds and no pair. So we know four groups is tetrahedral, but one of the group is what? Is lone pair, right? So the derived geometry of the molecule is trachinal pyramidal. And trachinal pyramidal is not a symmetrical shape because all the bonds are pointing up. They cannot cancel each other. So polar bond cannot cancel each other. NH3 is polar. Okay, this one is polar. Okay, that's how we analyze everything, the logic. Okay, again, guys, I want you to use these as a practice to uh, test if you understand the stuff we learned in our lecture. Okay, these are more uh, examples, okay, more examples. And again, practice the polarity of different compounds. All right, finally, the last topic of this chapter is we're gonna briefly talk about, very simple, to name molecular compounds. Okay, they're not ionic, they're molecular because they're individual molecules. You have seen that we have, we have actually show the structure of each one. So how do we name these molecular compounds? And again, how do we know they are molecular? Nonmetals. Okay, they're nonmetal molecules. They're nonmetal elements. Okay, if you have metal, you're talking about ionic. We learned the naming ionic in chapter four already. Here is chapter five. We're focusing on naming molecular compounds. Okay, molecular compounds. The rule is shown in here. You name 
the first element with lower electron activity. Then you name the second element using the base name plus eyed weight. So the name of the first element followed by the base name of the second element plus eight, which is very similar to what we have learned in chapter four. However, the biggest difference here is after you name these elements, you have to add prefixes to indicate the number of each atoms in front of the, the names. Okay, so in, in front of each name, there should be a prefix. The prefix indicate what? The subscript, the number of each atom. That is the biggest difference. Okay, the name wise, it's the same as we learned in chapter four for ionic compound. Name of the first element, the stem name or base name of the second element for plus eight, that's the same. But here for molecular compound, you have to indicate the number of each atom using prefixes in front of each name. Here, take a look at these 10 examples. Okay, I want you to use them to practice back and forth. You can cover the name and practice by yourself. Okay, the prefix from one to 10 are listed here. Mana, mana, di, tri, tetra, penta, hexa, hepta, octa, nona, deca. Okay, these are the prefixes. Indicate what? The subscripts. To indicate the subscripts of each atom. And you can say that each name Dinitrogen tetroxide. Okay, dinitrogen tetroxide, dioxygen, difluoride, right? You can see each name in front of it has a prefix. Okay, after you look at these 10 names, I want to ask you what exception did you look at? Okay, what exception? If you look at number one, number five, and number seven, these three molecules, you will notice that. The first element in one, five, and seven, the carbon, the chlorine, five, the iodine is seven. The subscript is one. When subscript one is, there should be a mono in front of it. But in those three cases, we did not put the mono. You guys noted that? Carbon monoxide instead of monocarbon monoxide. Okay, chlorine pentafluoride instead of monochlorine and iodine heptafluoride. So when the first mono is in front of name, we don't use it. Okay, we don't use mono to begin with the name. If the first element, the subscript is one, we don't use mono. That's one of the exceptions. Okay, otherwise you have to include the subscript. Include the prefix to indicate the subscript in, in, except the first element if it is mob. Okay, that's one exception. Okay, here is the quick practice. Which one of this is not correct? Answer is B. Okay, it should be diphosphorus pentoxide, right? Diphosphorus, phosphorus too, so diphosphorus. Another exception is showing this table. Okay, not an exception, but some molecules. Over the years, we are used to using their common names and accept their common names as the systematic naming name. So instead of naming this molecule, we just use their accepted common names as their real name, like, like H2O, right? The common name is water. We don't name it. Okay, CH4, the common name is methane, and we don't name it in the way we learned. Okay, H2O2 is not dinitrogen dioxide, it's hydrogen peroxide. Again, these are the common names we accepted as their official name. So when you see these molecules, you use their common name. And the last exception is when hydrogen is the first element in the formula. Okay, when you have a hydrogen is the first element, I look at the bottom to H2S and HCl. When hydrogen is the first element, the molecule name has no prefix at all. We don't use numerical prefixes at all. Both the first or second element, you don't care. We don't use prefixes. So H2S is hydrogen sulfide. HCl is hydrogen chloride. You see that? There's no prefix for this compound if hydrogen is the first element. So there are three exceptions when naming these. 
follow these rules with prefixes, indicate the number, but there are three exceptions. Keep that in mind. First exception, we don't use mono at the beginning of the name. We have some common names for these molecules. And if we have a hydrogen as the first element in the formula, we don't use numerical prefixes at all. That is all for this chapter. I hope you learned all these aspects. It's a long chapter, so you can pause. I hope you have paused or studied slowly. And uh, feel free to ask me with any questions. Bye now. I'll see you in chapter six.